Well, hello world. Welcome to Raccoon Point Studios. I'm Sean Bombs, and today I'm going to give you a quick tour of the control room here. But before I do that, just a brief history on how I got here in the first place. Um, in the 90s, I was still in high school, and I started recording on a four-track tape machine. I can't remember if it was Yamaha or Tascam. I feel like it was a Yamaha. And I used a drum machine, a bunch of uh, guitar pedals. I would sing through the guitar pedals. That's how I would get delay and distortion and stuff like that um, and I would record the drums mono because I needed those three other tracks and then I would take all that stuff dump it to two tracks so I could record more but every time you do that more noise blah 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 but did what I had to do and they were demos I, I wasn't going to get a record deal or anything with them they were for writing and having fun fast forward to getting out of high school started my first band Met a bunch of people in the suburbs of Philadelphia and in Philadelphia, and uh, some of those people were not only in bands, but re worked at recording studios. And so I met some sound engineers and recording engineers, and at the time, you know, I liked what I did in the bedroom. I didn't have any aspirations of becoming a recording engineer, so, but I was uh, definitely impressed by the people that were doing it and what I heard them doing. And so... Uh, you know, I had recorded at a few recording studios and then in 99 recorded a an album at Groundhog Studios and they had a they had a reel to reel and they had a 32 I think it was a 32 split console 32 channel split. I think it was 16 and then 60. I forget. Something like that. But uh you know, they had the real deal, you know, and and uh, my friend worked there, and he recorded us, and I was like, wow, you know, the sound, it, it sounded really good. So um, I was like, always thought I would love to do that, and if he can do that, I can do that, you know, kind of thing. So, you know, that was always in the back of my head. But uh, 2003, I started working at my first recording studio, and by then, everybody was moving to Pro Tools, and digital and tape machines were slowly going um, on their way out as far as viability and cost. So, you know, um, we had a Digio one there and a 32 by 8 Mackie uh, board. And so it was bare bones, you know. I, there, was, there wasn't even an outboard compressor or anything there at the time. But uh, it had a nice little live room and... It had a vocal booth, and, you know, we had the the uh, control room was small, but it was isolated. It was a floating control room, so it was actually really, really put together really nice. I started working there, and I didn't really know much about computers at the time because it wasn't, like, something that I was super interested in for a long time. Now I'm all about it. So I had to learn a bunch of stuff, you know, and I didn't understand Pro Tools at the time at all, like... I just want to know, how do I get the sound into the console, out of the console, into Pro Tools, out of the speakers, and then how do I mix it? So, all that kind of stuff. So, it was a, a learning curve, and, uh, you know, it was very frustrating at times for me, because I couldn't wrap my head around it in the beginning. So, just if you're new to engineering and to any kind of software, you just got to be patient, give it time, learn little things at a time, you know, and... uh and practice. So I, I worked there for a while and um, I don't know, 2008, 2009, I moved on. I just, I think I just burned out and um, I just didn't feel like recording other people at the time. I was ready to just work on my own music. So I had this little boss recorder, BR864, I think it was. And so that had a eight, it was eight channels, 64 virtual channels, something like that. I don't know. It had a built in drum machine. And you just use like compact flash cards to record to. And I I recorded a lot of music. I just went into a creative period of just nonstop writing. So that thing was very valuable to me. It did two things for me. I recorded with it and then it also acted as my drummer and backing tracks because I was uh, the band that I had put together was just me and one other guy and he played guitar and I played the guitar. So we were doing all this cool stuff with the, the guitars and then the drum machine and a backing bass track would 
do the rest. And because I had recorded already, I didn't need to redo anything. It was already there. Yeah, it was odd to me because I was used to having a drummer behind me. And I don't know about you, but drummers are usually what I watch when I go to, uh, when I go watch a band or something like that. So fast forward to 2012, I meet my wife. How I met my wife was a mutual friend to, said, hey, we need a guitar player. You want to try out? And then I go try out, and it's my wife's band. So we became friends. We later on became more than friends. And she had heard my demos from these, the, from the boss recorder, and, and she was impressed with the sound of the recording. So she was like, why aren't you, you know, producing or recording people or working at a studio anymore? And, you know, I just said I kind of got burned out with it, and I just didn't like dealing with people at the time it, and it wasn't the people it was me at the time I just I had something going on you know we go through different things in life and at that point in my life I didn't have the patience to deal with other people we decide you know we're going to record our band my band broke up her band broke up we created our own band we were going to start recording stuff all right um all I have is this little recorder so we decided you know it's time to get some gear and I didn't know what to get then because when I worked at the other recording studio in 2004, everything was already there, you know? So, and then by 2012, you know how music gear goes, like things change a lot in that eight years as far as um, Pro Tools allowing third-party uh, interfaces um, and... You know, that's just the quality of conversion. And then UAD came out with the Apollo. So, you know, so we asked the friend who's a producer out in L.A., you know, what, you know, get, give us a list of stuff to get started. So, you know, got an iMac, a Personas Fire something, some, some microphones, you know, some speakers, probably rocket. Yeah, got some rockets. <laughs> and, uh... And I set up in my bedroom and on a flat table, no, no risers, no nothing, not even the, 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 I didn't even have the monitor set up in a proper way or anything like that. And, uh, all my mixes sound like I got some, got some treatment, some foam and some bass trapping and things started to get better. And then... I don't know what happened, but I I ended up at Alto Music, and I saw the poster for the Apollo there, and I was like on the phone with my other friend, and he was talking about the Apollo, and I was like, <laughs> talk to the sales rep, and he was like, yeah, man, you know, so I had the first Apollo, and it just opened the world up to me because. I could track through the plugins um, because I didn't have any outboard gear. I didn't have a real 1176 or anything like that. So I was able to track in real time with compression and different things like that. And it was the way I like to work. I like to commit stuff. I like to get my sounds coming in. I don't, I'm not into manipulating every single thing afterwards. I want to get it close as possible coming in. I'll tell you, the Personas, Fire, whatever it was, had better outputs. I don't know, the monitoring. That first Apollo had this gritty mid-range thing happening, and I noticed it right away, and I wasn't even, like, tuned like that yet. But I noticed that right away, and I was like, this doesn't, you know, that part didn't sound that great. But the workflow was awesome. And then they came out with the next Apollo, and... That sounded light years better. And then now I have the X, whatever, and that's even better. But went on the journey and just started trying different things. Built an 1176 by Hairball Audio. Started building Cappy preamps. And I went down that rabbit hole. And, you know, I had all the 500 racks. I had an Argosy desk with 500 racks and... Um, all the stuff I built. So I built a bunch of Cappies uh, preamps, a bunch of Cappy EQs, and just went through a lot of different, trying different things out. And if it didn't work out, I sold it or, you know, how we do. 
Yeah, so I built all that stuff, and then and we had our recording studio in Philly in our basement. Um, but I had treated everything so well that, and we luckily enough only had one neighbor that touched us, and uh, and they were a bunch of college kids or straight out of college, so they didn't care. And then it was just a vacant lot next to us, and so we were fine to record whenever we wanted. I had that going, and I started building stuff, just trying different things, and then we moved down here, and we had the opportunity to buy a used API 1608 from a studio up in New York uh, through Alto, and it had the automation in it and all that stuff. Not that it, I'll use it, the automation. I've used the automation, but I don't use it as much as, you know, it's only 16 channels, so it's like... It's kind of like good for recall if I just want to sum things through it. And then a lot of times for most artists, I will sum through it and then just have a nice master bus chain because um, it would be a pain in the ass to write all that stuff down. And most people don't understand recall like that. So what I'll do is usually have just the master chain that's easy to, easier to just take pictures or whatever and then save those files with the session. And that way I can do that. And if I want to, I can save the fader placements on here for the session. So if I have the master bus at a certain place, whatever, you know, going into all this stuff. But I try not to have recalls. <laughs> anyway, so let's get to the f thing, dude. This is a lot. This is a lot, I think. That's how we got here. Let's do the tour real quick, all right? All right, so here we have the console. And sorry about the glare there, but I'm trying to light this up the best I can. And I have two API 50, 550Bs and then eight BT50s by Cappy that I built myself. And then two API 565 filters and so you know i use all that for tracking but i can use it for mixing if when i'm mixing my own band stuff then i do all this stuff because when, when i have it up then you know I, it's up i'm not touching anything and i know i only will do that if i know i'm not tracking a band or anything so that way i can get all my stuff together because and when I do it I'm trying to mix a whole album so I you know because I usually track <clears throat> instruments by the day usually or whatever and that that way it's pretty cohesive already so I can most of the time get away with the same kind of settings for each song and do all the other work in the box if I need to change things but I can get things tonally similar so, and then I have the SSL UF1 and UC1 and then the Avid app. And I used to have the S3 here, but I recently just fell in love with the workflow of the UC1 because I'm a hands-on type of guy. So that's just how I like it. Um, it's not needed, but that's what I like. Here I have AMLs. Uh, 1073 style stuff and a SSL style bus compressor from Dramatic Audio. It's the Obsidian. And then I have the Neve uh, 542 tape. And then I have an SSL ultraviolet stereo EQ that's hard to see back there. Sorry about that. Maybe I should put a light there. I don't know. And then over here, I have the Fusion, which is actually really fu really awesome. Then I have the LA 2A, two uh, distressors. I have the Valley Dynamite Drum Crush Champion of the World. I love that thing for uh, parallel drum bus. And then I have a Yamaha X990, a Lexicon PCM70, the API 2500, which gets a lot of drum love and if it's like hip-hop or house music or something like that then it's a master bus champion for me i love the chandler um 
for master bus and drums. And then the 2116s I built, they're hairball audios. Oh, and then my wife's Ampeg SVT uh, 3 Pro, which really sounds awesome. The line out of it or whatever it is sounds great. The preamp sounds amazing, actually. Um, I used to use the UAD plug-in all the time. But once I tried that thing, I was like, holy solid. I already had this dangerous music uh, monitor system before the API, and I am just didn't want a whole different tone than what I'm going to actually print because the monitor outs have transformers in them, so it could color the sound and all that jazz. So anyway... Then I have all this. I have four four patch bays by Switchcraft and their D subs on the back, so it makes it a little bit easier um, as far as connections go. I don't feel like soldering every single thing, but uh, the Apollo 16 and then the Burl B2 bomber for capture when I sum, and and a lot of times for actual I use that too for uh, you know tracking because it's just got a nice flavor to it. So the patch bay is, um, the top right here is the live room mic panel, and that's normal to the API preamps. And then I have the ISO booth that is not normaled, and it goes to the doghouse, which is what I showed you with the uh, SSL style bus compressor and all that stuff on the other side of this whole setup. And uh, <clears throat> so that's above that, so I can access, um, you know, whatever preamps that are in this room as well. So that makes it a lot easier. So the, you know, I can if I'm tracking guitars, I can either use the AMLs or the or the uh, API preamps, or I can mix the two. And so it gives me a lot of versati versatility. So, um, you know, and it makes it so people can be recording in the live room and the vocalist can be up in the vocal booth if they want to be and blah, blah, blah. Or I also have, uh, TT to, um, XLR cables. So if somebody wants to just record in the room with me, it's not a problem and all that stuff. Then I have all my inserts over here. So... They are not normal either, so that way I can just go to the bottom here where I have outboard gear and connect to the inserts on the API and I can have a quick AB if I need it or, you know, that way I can have my routing in a specific way. So it makes it a lot easier to connect with the channel. The direct outs of the API go right into the Apollo and then the Apollo outs go right into the API line ins. So that way I can um, go out of Pro Tools right into the line ins of the API. I don't have to, and they're normal, so I don't have to patch anything there. So it's already connected. The only reason I would is if I didn't want to use the inserts for some reason, and I wanted to go out of a channel into something directly um, for whatever purpose. <clears throat> but it's just nice to have. And then I have my cue out here. And that's coming from the, the dangerous monitor. And there's my mix right there with the yellow coming out. So that's the output of the actual console. And that goes into my master bus chain and then back into the barrel but uh the the master bus of the of the uh, console does have an insert but i think i need to get it looked at or whatever and i just don't feel like sending it in and waiting because i'll just ride the master bus right into my hardware it actually gives me a little bit more control because going into the insert then you're kind of stuck with whatever it is but i mean 
I like riding the the channel into the bus processors. It's it's a gives me one extra step of control there, I think. So anyway, then I have Focals and Avantone for crappy listening pleasure, but it helps me to uh, hear the mid-range really well so I can hear my vocal to guitar or you know whatever kind of music I'm mixing at the time. It really helps me with certain balances and when I'm editing vocals. It can help as far as like if I have cuts and stuff like that, it'll help me really hear how things are together so they don't sound like they're punch-ins and stuff like that. So that helps with that kind of stuff. And and if I have to tune, it'll help because I'm just hearing, you know, I'm not getting all the low end messing with anything. So there we go with that. And then back there I have other focals, the trios and and uh, they are connected to with they're not connected to the but they when they come on the sub comes on. So subs right there. I don't know if you can see it. Hopefully you can see that. But there's a sub under there. And so that's my tracking. That's what I use when I'm tracking. It's my get hype speakers. This room's not big enough to have proper um, loudspeakers. It would be it would be too much. But um but these are kind of like midfields, I guess, but they're they're loud enough to with with the sub, they're loud enough to really feel good when you're tracking. And then I'll use the 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 twins for mixing. I mean, I go back and forth between them, but if I don't want to hear all the low end, but I want to hear a good representation of the mix, then I'll use the twins and they're non-fatiguing where the trios they don't they're not fatiguing but they definitely have more high end and more low end and are more powerful so if you're listening loud yeah you, you probably get tired but everything in here i built a bunch of walls for the it's hard to see but um this whole wall here is in front of glass so i had to build a bunch of panels that are filled with you know filled with stuff <laughs> rocks rock rock roxel i forget what it's called but you know the stuff the stuff that that helps with sound so safe and sound yeah that's it safe and sound and then i have like these uh different types of um absorption blankets or whatnot or reflection blankets they help with the sound because um you know the drum room is downstairs I'm going to do a full tour of this studio, but I just was showing you. That's the control room. And then if you come out here. Uh, there we go. Let me see. There is the drum room. So, <clears throat> so that's, that's how that goes. And then these windows are... I have windows here, but I cover them <coughs> with sound barrier type of whatever curtains and they help keep the sound out because yeah because we have all sorts of sounds that come around here for some reason but um that's that that's the control room and if you have any questions feel free to comment down below i will be doing videos on how to use all this stuff and how I use all this stuff and, you know, just different things on production, tracking, and all that stuff. You know, I will be doing things weekly. I don't know what the f I'm saying anymore. I hope this video is okay. Hey, so I'm just going to do a quick little thing with the with the console. Just three channel or yeah, three stereo channels going in and blah, blah, blah. Bye.